Welcome to this beginner guide to the Sanctum of Rebirth. In this video, we're going to take some inexpensive necromancy gear with beginner perks and go over every single boss fight and every mechanic in detail so that you can comfortably run the Sanctum of Rebirth in normal mode. And if you're lucky, you might even find yourself a set of tier 95 magic weapons. The Sanctum of Rebirth can be accessed by completing the Soul Searching quest, which is a novice quest with the only requirement being the necromancy tutorial. Unlike in the rest of Gilinor, the Sanctum of Rebirth has a unique death mechanic that allows you to safely die three times per boss fight in normal mode without losing your progress. So if you die, your character is going to get back up and continue fighting. On your fourth death, you'll be transported to safety and you will not have to pay a reclaim fee. This makes the Sanctum of Rebirth great for working on improving your PVM fundamentals and makes it a lot more lenient than almost everywhere else in RuneScape for learning. For armor, I'm using a set of tier 70 death dealer, which is the necromancy power armor but feel free to swap it out for whatever you'd like if that's not what you have. For perks, I'm using Crackling 4 Relentless 3, Impatient 4 Mobile, Biting 3, and Invigorating 4. If you're looking for more information on how to get invention perks, I've put a link in the description down below. I'm also using a tier 90 Necromancy Death Guard and a Skull Lantern augmented with Precise 6 and Eruptive 4. You can go in with tier 70 or above, but the tier 90s are extremely useful in the Sanctum because the final boss in the Sanctum is pretty hard to hit. Following that, I'm wearing an Amulet of Souls, but of course, if you have an Essence of Finality, that will be better. I'm also using the Occultist Ring, a Skill Cape, a Nexus, which holds my Necromancy Runes and Ectoplasm, and last but not least, in my pocket slot, I have a Scripture of Jazz. None of these upgrades are crazy expensive, but of course, this is not a best-in-slot setup. Feel free to make upgrades and substitutions if you'd like, but if you've got this setup, it is more than good enough to complete the Sanctum. In my inventory, we're starting off with an Overload, an Adrenaline Potion, and a stack of Vulnerability Bombs, which are going to grant me an additional 10% damage for 60 seconds when thrown. After that, I've got an Excalibur for healing, which is extremely optional. I also have a Power Burst of Vitality, which will double my HP for 6 seconds and can be optionally used to tank large amounts of damage safely. And then to round out my inventory, I've got a collection of Green Blubber Jellyfish and Sardomen Brews for healing three Super Restore Flasks for prayer, and last but not least, the Expensive Spices Necklace from the Let Them Eat Pie Quest, which gives me additional healing when I'm eating those Blubber Jellyfish. As for auras, we're doing something a little bit different this time around, and I'll be using Equilibrium. This aura makes it so that I can't critically strike, but boosts my base damage by 12%, which is extremely strong and will result in a net positive amount of damage in the Sanctum. If you don't have the Equilibrium Aura, consider using Supreme Invigorate, Majorat, or Aegis, but all of my personal records are with the Equilibrium Aura, even at the very, very top end. This thing is really strong. For summoning familiars, I'm recommending an Ice Nihil for the 5% increased hit chance. It's going to help a ton on the final boss, but if you don't want to take a Nihil, consider using a Blood Reaver, a Ripper Demon, or a Hellhound, whatever you'd prefer. Now, let's look at the Ability Bar. If you want to copy this Revo Bar to keep your Conjurers up and running and build you some stacks for free, you're welcome to do so. But the Sanctum of Rebirth features a lot of movement mechanics, and because of that, it might be a really good opportunity to try out some manual combat if you're into that. On the subject of movement, if you've completed the Succession quest and unlocked the Dive ability, it is extremely good in the Sanctum, and it's worth getting. With our gear and inventory setup out of the way, it's time to step into the Sanctum and meet our first of three bosses, Vermix the Broodmother. Heading into Vermix, I'm going to do my pre-fight setup, which is to drink an Overload, and then I'm going to summon up all of my Conjures, apply the Darkest Incantation, and also use Life Transfer and Command the Ghost. From that point, I'm going to use Death Mark, and then I'm going to command my Skeleton before surging in to the boss fight. In order to attack Vermix, I'm using a Keybind for Target Cycle, which is going to automatically target my character onto the nearest available target without having to click on it. If you want to use Target Cycle, you can find it in the control settings, and I personally have it keybound to Tab. If you don't want to use Target Cycle though, all you need to do is click on Vermix's head and you will be able to begin attacking. As for my DPS rotation, we're not doing anything too fancy here, but because I'm on 100% Adrenaline, I've decided that it might be a good idea to use Living Death. And then all I'm doing from here on out is I'm simply building up my stacks and I'm spending them accordingly. Whenever I have six or more Necrosis stacks, I'm using Finger of Death, and whenever I have three souls out of three, I'm using Volley of Souls. Vermix only has three mechanics, so let's go over the first of the three right now. The very first mechanic states that Shards of Moonstone mark your feet, prepare to move. And at this point, in just a second, you're going to see an area that I've marked on screen that is below where my current location was. And in just a second here, you're going to see a Shard of Moonstones land on that exact location. 
If you don't move out of the way from this, it's going to hit you for 4,000 damage, and it's also going to knock off your Protect Prayers if you have them active. Once Vermix reaches 300,000 life points, you're going to get a pop-up on your screen that says Vermix channels power from the Sanctum towards the west, and at that point, you want to move towards the western part of the room, where at this point, another head is actually going to spawn. These green arrows that I've marked on screen are extremely important, and to progress in the fight, what you need to do is correctly stand on the arrows three times in a row. I find in particular the first arrows come very, very quickly, so it might be a good idea to use the dive ability if it's further away from you than you'd like. But as soon as you're standing in the right area, the first soul is going to redirect, and then you're going to get a second set of green arrows. Simply move to that second set, and then repeat it again for the third set. If you happen to be within range of the head, you're able to build adrenaline, build up some stacks, or also attack it if you would like to, but this is completely optional. As soon as you've deflected three souls, you can then go back and resume attacking Vermix, the Broodmother, and get into the second phase. It's worth noting that if you fail to redirect a soul just like I did here, so this time around I'm only going to get to two out of three, what's going to happen is you're going to have to wait a brief period of time, but then this same phase is just going to repeat over and over and over again until completed. And there's also a good opportunity to mention one other thing that occurs in this boss fight. If you ever see a large glowing area on the floor throughout this entire dungeon, that is the new telegraphing system in RuneScape. And what it's trying to tell you is that in a very short period of time, there is going to be an attack on the ground covering the area that is marked in blue. So all you have to do whenever you see this is step out of it. As soon as the telegraphing disappears, you're going to see Vermix's head launch an attack in the exact area that was outlined. So there's no more having to worry about figuring out exactly where something's going to hit. You're going to know the exact precise location of every mechanic in this entire dungeon. Because in this instance, I channeled two of the three souls to the west, this time around, I only need to do one soul. It actually keeps track and it remembers how many I've done. So even though there are two more souls falling, I can safely ignore them and I can get back on to Vermix, the Broodmother. Something I'm going to mention here is that these additional heads that spawn deal a significant amount of damage. So especially if you're newer to this boss fight, it could be worth it to kill these extra heads before moving back on to Vermix. This is very much a personal choice, and what I personally like to do is deal as much damage to the heads as I can while I'm waiting for Vermix to reappear and while I'm redirecting the souls. If I'm able to successfully kill the head, that's just a bonus, but if not, it's not the end of the world and I'm still going to resume attacking Vermix and get back on for phase 2. For phase 2, it's going to go exactly the same as phase 1, and it's also going to lead with the exact same mechanic. There's an adrenaline bar under Vermix's head, and it's going to go up every time Vermix attacks me. As soon as it reaches full, that means that there's going to be a mechanic upcoming. And once again, we've got Shards of Moonstone, which we already know how to deal with. All we're going to do is wait for the icon that is going to appear under our feet, and then simply move. It's also worth noting that if you want to, you can actually attack these Shards of Moonstone, and they are an unblockable piece of terrain for the remainder of the boss fight, but this, generally speaking, isn't needed. And as soon as we're at 200,000 life points, we're going to repeat the exact same thing we did at the end of Phase 1, but this time on Phase 2 to the east. Just like that, that's one soul redirected, that is a second soul redirected, and then let's go redirect our third and final soul. After you've redirected the three eastern souls, you're able to get back onto Vermix, and it might be a good idea to surge or dive to get closer to the middle of the room just so that you can avoid the breath attack. And at that point, all we're going to do is continue to build and to spend our stacks. I'm electing to use a Living Death followed by an Adrenaline Potion here just to get me a little bit more damage and a little bit more Adrenaline to work with, but there's effectively nothing here that you have to do. Feel free to take this as slowly as possible, and the one thing that I am going to recommend is if you do notice that you're taking lots of damage from the heads, what you can do is pray deflect missiles. And now we've got our next mechanic, which is when Vermix will yell heal. And at that point, a scarab is going to spawn. These scarabs can actually not be damaged regularly unless they are stunned. And to stun a scarab, you've got two options. You can either use your death card special attack, which is going to do a high damaging stun, or what you can do is you can use what is my Y key, which is soul strike. And that's what I'm going to elect to use here. As soon as you use soul strike, the scarab is no longer going to be immune, and then you can kill it however you would like. After the healer, we're going to get another set of Moonstone Shards, which we already know how to dodge. So we're going to dodge them as normal and continue to attack Vermix. This is not a super complicated boss, and as long as you're keeping your life points nice and high, you've got your Conjures alive, you've got nothing to worry about. But there is one dangerous mechanic, which is coming up right here towards the end of the fight, where Vermix fires a powerful bomb that says to ready yourself. In normal mode, this is going to be one singular hit that Vermix just launched into the sky, and it's about to come down towards the ground, just like that. What I've elected to do here is a combination of Reflect and Resonance, which is a decent failsafe. 
Reflect is really nice here because regularly, this is gonna hit you 6,000 damage, but with Reflect Active, it's only gonna hit 3,000. But the thing about Resonance that can be a little bit dangerous is if the other outside heads are attacking you at the same time, they can occasionally snipe your Resonance, which means it won't go through. In this instance, everything splashed on me, so the Resonance worked, but there's an even better way to deal with this mechanic. Instead of using Reflect and Resonance, this time around, I'm actually gonna use Devotion and Resonance. This works extremely well here because the side heads and the main head are only gonna be attacking with range so long as I'm standing out. If I'm praying Deflect from range and I'm using Devotion, and then I use Resonance after that, it guarantees that the Resonance will not be sniped because nothing can hit me. And just like that, we've got a nice easy Resonance on the bomb attack. And once again, remember, if you mess up and it kills you, good news, your character is just gonna get back up and keep on fighting. So there's a ton of room for error to fine tune this and deal with it however you would like over time. But with that out of the way, as soon as we get Vermix under 30,000 life points, my death mark is going to activate and that is going to be the end of Vermix the Broodmother. Uh, let's get into Kezalam the Wanderer, the second boss of the Sanctum. To start things off, we're going to be doing our regular pre-build, which is making sure that our conjures are up and running, we're extending them with life transfer, and then we're also going to be commanding the ghost. After that, we'll be activating Deathmark, commanding the skeleton, and then running into the fight. Something I wanted to mention here is that I did accidentally activate the Invoke Lord of Bones incantation before heading into this boss fight. Uh, this incantation will increase your damage potential so that if your damage potential number that I've shown on screen is under 100%, it will actually increase it as your skeleton attacks. Fortunately, at Kezlam, you already have 100% with the setup, so me activating Lord of Bones doesn't have any impact at all in the fight. Basically, it doesn't do anything. That being said, if you did happen to have the Lord of Bones incantation, it is a really, really good option for Nakatra, the third and final boss. That said, it is not used in this video because we're keeping the budget nice and low. Once you're ready, head into the fight and make sure to apply a vulnerability bomb. Keslam is very similar to the first boss, but there is one crucial difference, which is that Keslam is actually stunnable. This means that if you have Dreadnips from the Dominion Tower, they're actually extremely useful as they're actually gonna end up delaying Keslam's special attacks, which is gonna give you more free time to deal damage. That being said, let's get into those mechanics right now. Just like for the first boss, Keslam has an adrenaline bar underneath his head that is gonna fill up as he attacks. And the very first mechanic when you walk into the room, Keslam is gonna say Darakin. And then at that point, you're gonna see areas on the floor begin to glow. And just like the first boss, whenever your character is standing in the blue area, that is a good indication that you want to move, either by walking, running, using surge, or using dive. If you're unable to get out of the way, what's going to happen is those areas are all going to explode and you're going to take about five to 6,000 damage. If you're someone that's struggling with the area mechanics on the floor, it is also a good note that you can use Resonance, you can use Reflect, or you can use Debilitate to greatly reduce the damage that you're taking. And if you do that, you can probably just stand in one spot and not have to move. That being said, it is absolutely worth learning the movement, and this is a really good opportunity to practice it, because for the next boss, you're probably gonna need it. The second mechanic of the Kezlam boss fight is a Moonstone Prison. What's gonna happen is Kezlam is gonna empty his adrenaline bar, and then you're gonna see a bar that I've marked on screen that is underneath your character's head. As soon as this bar fills up, you're gonna find your character stunned and put in a Moonstone Prison. And you're also gonna notice a ball of energy falling down from the sky that is going to hit your character. There are two methods to get out of this. The first method is a little bit harder, but also is a little bit faster. And then the second method is the one that I would actually recommend, and I think it's significantly easier when you're in normal mode. The first method is as follows. As soon as you find yourself stunned, you're gonna use the freedom ability. Alternatively, you could also use the anticipate ability as long as you do so before the bar above your head is full. Once you've cleared your stun, all you're gonna do is either click or target on one of the moonstone crystals, and then you're gonna use a powerful ability to make yourself an exit. Each crystal has 7,000 life points, so plan accordingly. Once you've broken the Moonstone, you're gonna run outside of the Moonstone Prison before the energy ball hits the ground. As soon as the ball of energy hits the ground, it is going to destroy the remainder of the Moonstone Prison. But that's a lot of inputs to do pretty quickly, especially having to clear the stun, break your way out, and then move out before the crystal collides. So this is an even easier way. For this method, once we get put in our Moonstone Prison, instead of doing anything, we are quite simply just going to wait. The stun is going to clear on its own after 4 seconds, and at this point all we're going to do is we're actually going to watch Kezlam. Kezlam is going to attack your character exactly once, and as soon as you see the hit splat that Kezlam has attacked, you are then going to use the Resonance or Divert abilities. Using one of those abilities is going to completely negate the hit, and the hit is also going to blow up the remainder of the Moonstone Prison. So that way, instead of having to time a bunch of inputs in a row, all you need to do is time one singular defensive ability. Let's watch it back again. There's the bar above my head. I'm stunned. I'm just going to let it clear by itself. And then as soon as Kezlam attacks me and I see the hit splat, 
I'm hitting resonance. And just like that, we've managed to completely negate the Moonstone Prison, and it was significantly easier than having to fight my way out. Now that we've broken out of Ice Prison Jail, let's get ready for the second mechanic of the boss fight. For this one, we've got even more ground mechanics that we want to avoid. But interestingly enough, these are going to be dependent on where your character is standing. Because I'm standing kind of in a middle distance of the room, Keselam is going to say Kaya, and at that point, the area underneath my character is going to be lit up in blue. Just like at the first boss and earlier on in the Keslam fight, if the blue area is underneath you, you want to get out of there as soon as you possibly can. But you don't need to panic, and you've actually got plenty of time to either move forward or backwards. You can do this with dive, or you can just simply walk, which is what I like to do here. But Keslam is actually going to do this a second time, and like I said before, it's based on where your character is standing. So because I just moved in, the very next one that's going to happen is going to be the inner area of the boss fight as close to Keslam as possible. So just like last time, we're then going to move out and avoid all damage. You really don't need to go too crazy with the movement here. If you want to use something like escape to move back out, you're more than welcome to, but I found in normal mode, the easiest way to get by was to quite simply walk it both times. Once Keslam reaches 396,000 life points, you've reached the end of phase one, and Keslam is now going to be completely immune to damage until you take care of one of the two Moonstone Obelisks on the north or the south of the room. Because I'm already facing south, we're going to deal with the south one. The very first thing I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to apply a death mark, because that's going to save me a little bit of damage. The Moonstone Obelisks in normal mode have 60,000 life points, and you need to kill it completely before the timer that I've marked on screen reaches full. This shouldn't be too hard of a DPS check, but it is possible to fail this, and if you do, it's not the end of the world, because the HP and the damage you've dealt with is actually saved. So you're going to lose a little bit of time, Keslam is going to heal up a little bit, you're going to have to repeat a very short amount of the fight, and then you can finish off the Obelisk from whatever life points you left it on. As soon as you get through this obelisk, you can get back on Keslam and continue progressing through the fight. You may also notice that Keslam's HP is a little bit higher than it was before, because while the Moonstone Obelisk is alive, Keslam is going to heal a little bit. You can reduce this heal by using the Magic Obliteration Staff Special Attack, which is extremely niche, but I find this to not be worthwhile at all, especially if you're using Necromancy, and that involves pulling out a magic weapon. We're not doing that here, so we've got a little bit of extra damage to deal to get back to the phasing threshold. Keslam is going to continue to use the same mechanics as before, so just as we learned before, Keslam says Kaya, we move forward. Keslam says Gra, we move backwards, and it's very, very straightforward. There's actually only one new mechanic that's happening in Phase 2, and I'll let you know as soon as it happens. But for now, this is a really good window of time to try to get some good damage dealt to the boss. And now we're heading in to the new mechanic on Phase 2. This time around, Keslam is going to spawn two Scarabs in the arena. And very similar to the Scarabs in the first boss fight, all you need to do to be able to deal damage to them is stun them. But unlike the previous scarabs that were healers, these ones are actually volatile scarabs. And what they're going to do is when the bar above their head reaches full, they're actually going to explode, dealing you upwards of 6,000 damage each. So it's really, really important to pay attention to these ones. And if you feel like you haven't had a special attack in a little while, or Keslam's just been attacking and attacking and attacking, it is very possible that Keslam has sneakily spawned some scarabs, and you might be in for a world of pain. So definitely make sure to look around, make sure you're paying attention, and the best way to stun them and deal with them is to quite simply use Soul Strike. Soul Strike is really effective here because these Scarabs don't have too many life points, so it should one-shot them completely. Just make sure you've got your two souls, spend them on the Scarabs, and you'll be good to go. You're also going to notice that once the Scarabs have spawned, Keslam is going to continue to attack you, and because of that, he's got the ability to go through some additional mechanics at the same time. The mechanic after spawning the Scarabs, in this instance, is another ground area mechanic on the floor. In this case, he's going to say Pain, and all I'm going to do is move out of the way as part of the room explodes. And just to show you what happens if you miss the Scarab, this is exactly what happens, and that is a massive 6,700 damage hit. If you were to miss both Scarabs, that wouldn't be so good. Once the Scarabs have been dealt with, we're just going to continue to attack Keslam and work towards the end of the second phase. And you've already seen all of the mechanics at this point, so just deal with them in accordance to how we know how to deal with them. We've got more movement, and I'm just building and spending my stacks as always. There's really nothing fancy to do here in order to get us to the end of that second phase. And as soon as we've reached the threshold of just under 200,000 life points, we've got another Moonstone Obelisk that we're going to deal with exactly the same way as we dealt with the first one. But let's say you're having trouble dealing damage on this particular day, and you can't get it down in one cycle. Well, let me show you what happens then. In the instance where you don't deal enough damage, and you run out of time, you're going to notice that the Obelisk goes immune. And that is your sign to get behind the obelisk, whether it's at the north side of the room 
or the south side of the room as quickly as humanly possible. Because at that point, Keslam is actually going to shoot a wave mechanic that goes there and back across the majority of the arena. But as long as you're standing behind the obelisk, you will not take any damage. And then from that point, all we need to do is we actually need to get back on Keslam and get him back to the phase HP threshold. As soon as you get Keslam back to the threshold of just under 200,000 life points, he's going to phase again, and you're going to be able to continue killing the same Moonstone Obelisk from before, but this time it's already going to be at half HP because that's how much damage we did to it beforehand. Once the obelisk goes down, we're heading in to the third and final phase. And it's very similar to the first and the second phase. Keslam is gonna continue to cycle through the exact same mechanics, and there actually isn't a single new mechanic in phase three that we haven't already seen or dealt with. So this actually should be almost an easier phase than a lot of the previous ones. Make sure your conjures are healthy, deal as much damage as you can, and just keep watching Keslam's adrenaline bar to see when the special attacks are coming. This is a really interesting boss because when you first go, you're going to end up taking a ton of damage to the area mechanics on the floor. But as you learn it, it becomes very easy and consistent to either low food or completely no food him. You are going to notice here that I'm keeping my life points pretty low, and I would advise when you're first learning to keep your life points a little bit higher than this, just in case you take some damage or you get hit by something unintended. You also do have the Sanctum Death System though, that is going to pick you up if you run into any troubles. So although there are a lot of ways to take a lot of damage in this boss fight, it shouldn't be too too bad. As soon as Keslem gets under 30,000 life points, your death mark is going to activate and congratulations, you have now taken on the second of three bosses in the Sanctum of Rebirth. So with that said, why don't we get in to Nekatra, the final boss. The third and final boss of the Sanctum of Rebirth is Nekatra Devourer Eternal, and this boss is absolutely a step up from the first two. So expect, especially when you're learning, to burn a couple of your free lives on this one. But with that said, we're going to start off this fight exactly the same as all the previous ones. But before we do so, I want to take a quick look at the arena and make note of some of the markings that are on the floor. There are four little squares that I've marked on screen that are extremely safe and generally good places to stand. There are going to be lots of area mechanics on the ground here, so standing in a good location is going to make sure that we're in a way better spot to evade them and avoid a lot of damage. So with that said, and now that we've marked some areas on the floor, we're going to get our conjures ready, we're going to do all of our pre-fight, and I'm going to surge into Nakatra, and let's get it started. Something you're going to notice here is that my damage potential, which is on screen right now and has been marked, is 84%. This is worth noting because it means I'm actually only going to be dealing 84% of my total amount of damage. And that's why the Ice Nihil is so incredibly important here. Without it, we'd actually be in the 70s, which is generally lower than you'd want to be for a boss fight. That's just some rationale for why the Nihil is so important. We've got a death mark. Now I'm going to begin to attack the boss. And we're just going to be building and spending our stacks. And just like the previous two bosses that really hammer home visual clarity, Nekatra also has an adrenaline bar above her head. And as soon as it reaches full, that's when you're going to see the first special attack of the fight, which is a very simple wave area mechanic that's going to go from east all the way to west. It's very simple to avoid. All you need to do is simply step out of the way and you're going to avoid all damage. It's worth noting that if this does hit you, it's going to deal about four to 5,000 magic damage and you can put on your deflect magic prayer to reduce that. Something else that Nakatra does that is really interesting is between every special attack, she's going to alternate between attacking with magic and attacking with range. This means you don't have to look or focus on the auto attacks or count them in any way. It just means that every time you see a special attack, you can preemptively switch your prayer and you're always going to be praying correctly. And now we're going to continue working towards our second special attack. nakatra has got a full bar, which means she's going to say, prepare for death. And I will say, this is a little bit of a misnomer because this is going to be one singular high magic hit. It's very similar to the Arch Glacier Cannon in normal mode. First thing you can do is if you're praying Deflect Magic, it's only going to hit you about 5,000 damage. But even better than that would be to use either the Resonance or the Divert abilities to either get yourself all the way to full HP or to get yourself all the way up to full Adrenaline. You can choose whichever one of those two abilities you'd like, but that is by far the best and easiest way to deal with the Prepare for Death and be obliterated attack. Now we're going to continue to attack Nakatra. The third mechanic of the boss fight is exactly the same as the first one, so simply step out of the way as you always would. And once again, we're now back to praying deflect ranged. All I'm really focused on doing here is building and spending all of my necromancy stacks. We're not really doing any kind of complicated rotations, and as long as you're hitting stuff, you're going to be progressing through the fight. The only other mechanic on phase one you're going to encounter is a spawning of two scarabs. One of them is going to be the healing scarab from the first boss, and the second one will be the volatile scarab from the second boss. And these are dealt with in exactly the same way. 
So whenever you see scarabs, you wanna make sure that you have stuns available, which in this case is gonna be souls. By far the highest priority would be to deal with the exploding scarab, because even though there's a lot of time remaining on that exploding scarab, when it does blow up, it's gonna hit you for 7,000 damage. Whereas the healer is only gonna heal Nakatra by 30,000 damage at most, even if you completely ignore it. But ideally, you can deal with both. But I'm actually not gonna deal with them right away because unfortunately what's happened here is I've gotten a special attack directly into me hitting 640,000 life points, which is the start of phase two. And the second Nakatra starts phase two, you're gonna get another mechanic. So if you phase it at the wrong time, there is a chance that this is gonna happen and you're effectively gonna have to deal with two mechanics at once. As soon as you head into phase two, Nakatra is gonna say the Sanctum is mine to control. And then you're gonna see the first Sanctum hieroglyphs of the boss fight. At this point, a section of the room that is going to be different every single time is going to light up and be telegraphed with damage incoming. And at that point, as soon as you possibly can, you want to get out of the damage area. If you're hit by this, you're going to take upwards of 5,000 damage each time, and it's going to happen twice back to back. So although you'll survive if you don't do anything or if you just stand there and spam eat, it is definitely advisable to get out of it. So what I'm going to choose to do here is activate dive, and I'm gonna dive out of the way to avoid the damage taken. It's also worth noting that whenever you successfully dodge this mechanic, it's gonna say in your chat box, avoiding the attack gives you a rush of energy, resetting your movement ability cooldowns. Every single time you get this quadrant mechanic, if you dodge it correctly with dive, you're gonna get your dive back to dodge the next one with dive over and over and over again. I'm also gonna take a second here and mention the reason why we're standing in the area that I marked at the beginning of the boss fight. As you can tell here, I'm right on the line between four of the different quadrants. And as long as I can stay in one of those areas for the entire boss fight, I'm not gonna have to move very far to dodge these hieroglyphs. Now that I've dodged those two sets of hieroglyphs, what I'm now gonna do is actually do my soul strikes, spend my souls and get rid of the scarabs before having to take any damage. And now we're back to attacking Nakatra exactly as we were before. The next mechanic on phase two is a standard prepare for death. So what I'm gonna to elect to do is use a little resonance just like we did before, and we're gonna continue attacking. Every phase of this boss fight ramps up just a little bit with the telegraphing and the area mechanic. So expect that as the boss fight goes on, you're gonna have a little bit more moving to do. We've got the hieroglyphs again, and whenever she does them on phase two, you're always gonna get two back to back. That's my two hieroglyphs dealt with. Now we're just gonna continue attacking the boss. My conjurer's timed out there, so I'm actually gonna reconjure them, and I'm not gonna forget to command my ghost. Something else that's really important here is to make sure that you're consistently throwing vulnerability bombs. You don't need to throw 400 a kill, but as a general principle, it's really, really good to make sure that Nakatra is vulned as often as possible, because 10% damage really will add up. I've got another set of scarabs here, so this time around, I'm standing in the correct location to quite simply do two soul strikes and then finish off the healing scarab, which once again is a personal choice. You don't absolutely have to do this, but in my opinion, it's worth it, especially if you're standing right there. And now we've got even more hieroglyphs. But as you can see, even though a ton of the arena is lighting up and it looks extremely scary, because of the place we're standing, we actually don't really have to move very much at all. A lot of the time, it's one singular tile, which makes it a lot more manageable. If you were standing anywhere you wanted in the arena, it could be a lot more difficult and you'd probably take a lot more damage. We've got another prepare for death. So just like the first two times, I'm gonna throw a resonance and we're gonna continue dealing damage to Nakatra. And we're actually about to head in to phase three. So we're doing an absolutely stellar job so far. As long as we're resonancing that one prepare for death attack, we're actually not using any food at all, which is great. But now heading into phase three, things get a little bit different. And as soon as she says Nephthys, you're actually gonna see two soul devourer puppies spawning on the east and the west sides of the room. And these need to be killed before you can progress with the fight. At this point, you're also gonna see this really cool looking octagonal star-shaped telegraphing for these attacks, but it's actually quite easy to avoid just by standing exactly where I'm standing outside of that area. It is also really important to note that one really important mechanic of the Soul Devourers that you need to kill to progress through the fight, the further you stand away from them, the less damage they're gonna take. So you actually wanna make sure that you're in melee distance and you're letting them melee you and hit you. If you stand too far out, you're gonna have your damage completely reduced to the point that they don't take damage at all. So you really do wanna be standing where I'm standing here. But unfortunately, Nakatra is a little bit too smart than to just let you stand in the exact same location for the entire boss fight. So you are still gonna have some telegraphed area mechanics that require you to step out and then slowly step back in before the star one. One other trick I'm doing for the Soul Devourers is I am using Death Mark because it is going to help out just a little bit with the damage towards the end. As soon as you've killed the first one, we're then going to get on the second one. You're going to notice here that I take a ton of damage because instead of looking, I just decided to blindly surge across the room and I landed directly in to some telegraphed attacks. 
But two things are worth noting here. One, if I had died, it would have been completely fine and I would have just got right back up again. But the second thing that's really important is if you don't know exactly where the telegraphing is or where you're surging to, putting on the deflect magic prayer is really, really wise because that actually reduced the attack to the point that I didn't die just because I happened to have it on. After my near death experience, all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reapply my conjurers, I'm gonna apply my death mark, and I'm gonna continue to build up some stacks and attack the final soul devourer while dodging all of the area mechanics on the floor. It looks absolutely crazy when you're looking at the screen, but in reality, the movement is very, very simple for this section of the boss fight. And now, as soon as the final soul devourer has perished, it is time for the most difficult part of the boss fight, where Nephthys is gonna say, suffer the full power of the sanctum, and for the first time, you're gonna be dragged into the Shadowlands to meet the devourer. As soon as you get dragged into the Shadowlands, you wanna pray deflect melee, because the gorillas that I've marked on screen are gonna be dealing damage to you with melee, even though it's across the room. And then you wanna look out for a purple cloud of souls on your screen. I've marked it, and you wanna click on that as soon as you possibly can, to release the soul storm. As soon as you do, two feline ox are gonna spawn in the Shadowlands, and these two feline ox have to be killed and cleared out before your soul is devoured. If you wanna know how long you have before your soul is devoured, all you need to do is take a look under the boss HP bar, where there is a convenient and not stressful at all timer ticking down for how long you have to clear out these ox. I like to use a Threads of Fate combination here to clear them extremely quickly, but if you want to clear them one at a time, you're welcome to. You could also use Bloat or Soul Scythe. Any combination of those abilities is going to get them done no problem at all. Then, as soon as you kill them, you're going to see three soul fragments on the ground that you are meant to click on. But before you click on them and recover them, you may want to take note of the two icons that are currently on your screen. We'll call the one on the left the moon, and we'll call the one on the right the hourglass. It's really important that before you recover the soul fragments, take mental note of what these artifacts are. The reason this is really important is going to become apparent in just a second, because as soon as I release that final soul, I'm going to be going back into Nakatra, but this time around, there are going to be three icons on the floor. And the deal here is extremely simple. If you don't want to get insta-killed, you need to go to whichever icon was not present in the Shadowlands. If you look back at the clip in the Shadowlands, I had a hat and I had an hourglass, but I did not have what I would call the person sitting. So we need to stand directly on that icon to avoid an absolutely massive 40,000 plus damage hit. If you stand in the correct area, it's gonna say in your chat box that the missing Shadowlands hieroglyph protects you from Nakatra's barrage. And then as soon as that's done, you're gonna be able to attack Nakatra and deal as much damage as you possibly can. She's gonna be staggered for just a little bit, so this is a very good open DPS window where if you wanna use an ultimate ability, that's a great idea. But in a little bit, this phase is gonna get a little bit more crazy. So this is a really good opportunity to get your damage in, while you can. Now, we've got the this is over mechanic. This is a really interesting mechanic because there are a couple different ways of dealing with it with varying levels of difficulty. This is gonna be a shockwave that spawns in the catcher's feet and then runs all the way to the outside of the arena. One method of dealing with it that I'll put on screen is quite simply waiting for the correct moment and then stepping one tile forward exactly as it passes over you. And although it looks extremely cool, the timing is pretty precise to get it down. So in my personal opinion and my preference is actually to run away from the boss. And then as soon as you see the animation start under Nakatra's feet, which is right there, I'm quite simply just gonna use escape. And that's gonna put me back inside of the safe area after the animation has passed over me. But Nakatra doesn't just do this once. She actually does this twice. So I'm actually gonna do that twice back to back with escape. The timing on this isn't nearly as bad as it looks, but it does take some practice. But remember, because we're in normal mode and there's a resurrection mechanic, you actually can practice it, and you can feel free to fine tune the timing as much as you would like, because even if you fail once or twice or three times, you're still gonna be on phase four of Nakatra, and you're still gonna continue being able to fight. If you fail to dodge this final shockwave mechanic, you're gonna see, as I do right here, you're gonna take about 6,000 damage in normal mode, which is quite a bit, but as long as you eat up, it's okay, and there should be some leniency to miss it at least once and still end up quite all right. Another piece of advice I could give you for this is if you wanna use your power burst of vitality here, it's not a bad option. And that basically takes the stress completely out of it, because then even if you're tanking absolutely everything, you're not gonna run out of life points. As soon as that mechanic ends, we're then gonna have Nakatra building up her adrenaline bar, and we're gonna get hit by a magic blast. As Nakatra says, prepare for death. I'm gonna do what I always do here, and I'm gonna use resonance. And after that, we're gonna have a lot of hieroglyphs spawning back to back to back. Now that we're on phase three, it's gonna be three sets instead of the usual two. That's one, that's two, and that is the third one. 
You can also see here that there is an RNG component to this, because even though I was ready to dive and ready to move, I actually got pretty lucky here, and they didn't spawn on me a single time. So now, we're just going to cycle back into a lot of the usual mechanics from before. We've got some more area mechanics, where you can optionally just pray magic and tank the hit, but I'm going to elect to be perfect here and move out of the way. But Nakatra isn't done yet, and we're actually going to get another set of three hieroglyphs in a row. That's one, that's two, and that is going to be the third one. I also want you to note again where I'm standing. The area that I marked at the beginning of the boss fight, which I'll mark again now, is incredible as a location to stand for these hieroglyphs. It will make it a million times easier to not have to move very far at all to avoid them 100% of the time. After that third set of hieroglyphs, we're actually gonna get sent back into the Devourer's Plane for a second time. And you're gonna have to repeat this phase as many times as it takes to manage to completely finish off Nakatra's HP. This time around, I wasn't very far off a kill, but we did not get the one cycle, and that's completely okay. When you're first learning this boss, it could take three or even four cycles to get it done, but as long as you're paying attention and you're making sure that you're dealing with the mechanics correctly, you shouldn't have anything to worry about. And that right there is all you need to do to get yourselves tier 95 magic dual wield gear. With that said, thank you so much for watching this video. If you have any questions or comments, the comment section down below is the place for them. And last but not least, if you enjoyed the video, I would really appreciate it if you could subscribe to my channel. We're trying to hit 100,000 and I would really appreciate the support and the help. With that said, thank you all so much for watching the video. I hope you all enjoyed, and I will see you very soon for the next one.